New COVID variants are here in the U.S. and causing increasing concern among health officials. It's election day in Georgia, and one of the most famous businessmen in the world, MIA. Here's what you need to know. Good morning, this is Cheddar's Need to Know podcast for Tuesday, January 5th. I'm Jill Wagner with Carlo Versano. Carlo, good morning. Hey, Jill. Have you uh, recovered from that big Slack outage <laughs> yesterday? It, again, like the Google outage, it was like you realize how reliant you are on these tech companies and this technology when, when you don't have it. I, so Becky and I, um, you know, we're both working from home, obviously, in this tiny little apartment, and and both of us use Slack to communicate, right? And so it's 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 out, right? The, the thing doesn't work. I'm just sitting here like this is like putting putting the Slack thing aside, but like this is insane. We're going on a year now, right? And like we're all just supposed to pretend like everything's sort of like normal. It's like one of these one of these pieces of software breaks, and all hell breaks loose. You can't get in touch with anybody, and we're all just supposed to be like, oh well. You know, it is what it is. I don't know. I just <laughs> back to that point, by the way, that imagine this pandemic was happening 10 years ago. We I don't know would, what you do. I don't know what you would do. Yeah. I mean, working from home would be extremely difficult. Um, no FaceTime, no video chats. It is amazing how uh, how this technology we are so dependent on it now. My cousin tweeted something like, all right, Slack's down. Now we can actually get some work done. Which I thought was pretty yeah. true. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right, uh, let's get to some other news. Britain has now re-entered a national lockdown as this new variant of COVID-19 has caused case numbers to skyrocket. Schools are all remote. Britons are being told to only leave their home for essential trips until at least mid-February. That variant of the virus known as B117 has now been confirmed in California, Colorado, Florida, and New York in patients with no travel history. So this suggests that community spread is happening. The variant is believed to be more contagious, but not any more lethal in and of itself. Here we go again, Carlo. Yeah, exactly. And it's a little bit misleading because it's not, even if it's not any more lethal in and of itself, just by virtue of being more contagious, it sort of is more lethal. If that, if that sort of makes sense. Um, yes. And to explain I, that really quickly, it's because yeah. more people will get sick. Hospitals right. fill up. If hospitals fill up and you're one of the people who's very sick, you don't get as good of care. And so their yeah, the exactly. death rate goes up. So, I mean, if you look at the, the, the curve in the UK right now, it is literally straight up. It's just a vertical line. Uh, and keep in mind, this is a country that has been in some stage of lockdown now for going on a couple months. Uh, as a general rule, the U.S. has followed Britain or Britain has followed the U.S., but we've been very close in our curves um, when it comes to sort of new waves. So it's I, I don't have a good feeling about this, I have to be honest. There's not going to be a national lockdown here, uh, even under a Biden administration. But the, the, the fact is this this thing is spreading at a point at which hospitals are already at a breaking point here. Can't re- it's like the worst possible time for this to, to, to be happening. Um, also, Jill, the CDC saying that Arizona now has the highest rate of infection in the country supplanting uh, California. Last week, our deadliest yet, 18,400 Americans died uh, of COVID in the week ending January 3rd. So we are far, far from out of the woods on this thing. And then not to just, I mean, to, the, the hits keep coming. There's also this other variant in South Africa and it has public officials even more worried that current vaccines may actually not protect against it. Scientists in the UK say that the South Africa variant has even more mutations in the spike protein. So it's raising a lot of alarms about the efficacy of the vaccines. Even if it proved to be resistant, some vaccine makers have said that they could tweak the drugs to provide immunity. They say it'll take about six weeks in some mm-hmm. cases. Um, we don't know if it's going to be necessary, but then what does that mean for the people? I mean, they're not, I guess yeah. the silver lining in our incompetency to get the vaccine out is that very few people have gotten the vaccine. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's one that's <laughs> looking on the bright side, Jill. That's what I love about you. Um, 
I, look, it's a really fine line here for us in the media. You, you, you know, we don't want to scare people, right? Because there's nothing you can do about this. There's not like it is what it is. Uh, and the fact is, we just need a lot more information that we just don't have yet. And, um, but at the same time, if we've learned anything from this past year, it's been we, it's better to be over prepared. So we just have to stay on this. I, you know, people shouldn't freak out. I know that this stuff is sometimes like I read that story last night, the one that you just mentioned. And I was just like, are you effing kidding me? Like, can we just catch a freaking break, like, as humanity here? Um, speaking of the vaccine, I did want to mention this, Jill. A uh, hospital in Northern California had its uh, its freezer that was storing all of its Moderna COVID vaccines. It just broke, right? It went on the fritz, as freezers sometimes do. So what do they do? They just gave out. They had 600 shots. They just gave them out two hours. Whoever was around got one. Um, use it or lose it, right? So it, I just thought that was a great story because it shows we can do this, right? We can get these shots into arms. But we have to be making it easier, uh, not harder, with regard to the red tape um, and getting these uh, you know, hospitals and other facilities the money that they need and the staffing that they need. I, I hate to talk about New York all the time because we have such dysfunctional politics here. And I know that if you're in other parts of the country, you, you're like, whatever. Um, but <laughs> our governor and the mayor of New York City are fighting again here over um, this idea of fining hospitals. So Governor Cuomo says he wants to fine hospitals in New York if they don't speed up the vaccinations. And Bill de Blasio, to his credit, which I don't think I've ever said in my life, uh, called Cuomo arrogant, just said that's ridiculous. And we got to, you know, we have to be make, we, we don't need to just be like fining people, right? We just have to make it easier. I, it's watching these guys is like, it makes you want to bang your head against a wall. You know, I watched Cuomo's press conference yesterday. I don't know if you caught it. I did, yeah. Um, I'm finding him like beyond irritating with the um, with the yes. joking and like get the vaccine out there. And, and yeah. now he's saying it's going to be two weeks. So I, just to be clear, um, there are the first people who got the vaccines are now getting their second dose. It's been that long, right? right? Like we've had this vaccine mm -hmm. for three weeks. I didn't hear Cuomo necessarily talk about the fine for hospitals that are going too slow. He, I thought he just said that if they're not giving it out, they're like use it or lose it. They're gonna they they lose their privilege to to give out the vaccine, and they're gonna give it to another hospital that can that can do it more efficiently. Um, but it sounds like he wants to wait. So he said by the end of next week, everyone in that first tier should in nursing homes should be vaccinated. And then the second tier is this hodgepodge of, of different groups that are essential right. workers and on the front lines. And I and I understand the rationale because it's like he was saying, look, if you're a subway worker or whatever it is, you're in contact with so many people. So if you get it, you're yeah. essentially a super spreader. And all yeah, of this yeah, yeah. makes sense. But it's like at a certain point, just get this thing out, get it to people who need it. We know that the most vulnerable people are those over 70 with high, high risk. And I'm frustrated. I look at people like my parents who are like, yeah. we made it this far, we have a vaccine. And what you just said, yeah. Carlo, is can humanity catch a break? Yeah, we have a break. We have the vaccines, right? Yeah, we just right. need to get them out. Yeah. Um, That's what's so frustrating, right? We're so close. We're so close. We're so close. Uh, and I, I keep saying this to my dad. It's like, I, you know, my, my and, and I use my parents as just the example because it's their want. They're two of millions of people who are in this boat where they're like kind of hostage in their house, you know, and they they drop off things. We wave to them. You know, if I see them, it's with two masks on. Um, we have a solution here. What are we doing? I do want to say I, I just it, I, I'm trying to be the, to be sunny in this new year. Be, have a positive outlook. The, w the vaccines are speeding up. We're get we're 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 far far from where we need to be, but we're we're on the right track at, at a national level. So I just do want to put that out there. Um, we're going in the right direction. The latest that numbers way. that I saw from Politico is that about 15 million doses have been distributed, and only about four and a half million have actually been administered. That's a problem. Yeah. Sorry, you have a new variant yes. going out. Why are only one third of, of the vaccines actually in people's arms at this point? OK. Yeah. All right, I'm going to move on. <laughs> um, OK, guess what? It's uh, election day somewhere and this time it's Georgia. Here we go again. Georgians go to the polls today to vote in two runoff elections that will determine control of the Senate. Millions of dollars have poured into the state from both Democrat and Republican groups ahead of the vote. Both the president and president-elect flew to Georgia to rally their supporters on the eve of the election. Polls close at 7 p.m. Eastern, at which point ballot counting can begin. Like in November, the result probably not going to be known 
right away, likely not tonight because of absentee and mail-in ballots. Both races expected to be extremely close. Again, they can't count the absentee ballots until polls close. So right. that's likely going to be what the holdup is. Yeah, and I think uh, uh, you know, just be prepared out there if you're if you're hoping to like you know see results from this at you know right after the, the polls close. That's not going to happen. It's going to be like election day, right? Democratic counties in Georgia, counties like Fulton, DeKalb, they take longer to count, um, and they are they are generally. Um, you know, they, historically, they're just Democratic counties. And mail-ins have historically been favoring Democrats in that state and elsewhere. So you could sort of get this red mirage effect again, sort of like what we saw on election night, where it looks like Republicans are doing well, and then Democrats sort of, you know, come come from behind and, uh, and get more votes. So we'll see. One thing to remember, though, um, about this, because uh, – I just wanted to make this a little bit more clear. It, even if Democrats were to win both of these seats, which of course is a is a big if, that's going to make the Senate 50-50 split, right, with Kamala Harris as vice president acting as the tiebreaker in her role as the president of the Senate. Uh, it's not like they're going to have some huge majority. They'd still have to deal with the filibuster, which isn't going anywhere anytime soon. That's the rule that requires 60 votes for almost all major legislation, and it's a major reason why there's just so much gridlock in D.C., right, because it's so hard to get 60 senators to agree on anything. Um, so what I'm saying is, even if Democrats do pull it out today, it doesn't mean there's going to be some huge political mountainous shift. It does mean it would be easier for Biden to get things done, like probably more stimulus, uh, probably an infrastructure deal, maybe something on uh, strengthening Obamacare. But there wouldn't be these things like court packing, you know, single payer, Medicare for all. It would just make somebody like Joe Manchin probably the most important person in Washington. You know, he's the he's the very centrist West Virginia senator who would probably vote with Republicans on on some issues. I'm curious what happens to the market, by the way, if uh, Democrats win, because one market of the market tanked yesterday, by the way. And one of the reasons that that the market's been on fire post election was just this idea that that there would be some sort of balance. You know, lawmakers kind of like gridlock. You know, that they they wouldn't. No one party would be able to get an agenda passed. So investors, you mean? Pardon? Investors like gridlock. Investors yeah. like gridlock. What did yeah. I say? Lawmakers. They do too, I guess. I think they do too. <laughs> <laughs> Overseas. That way, they don't have to get they don't have to get blamed for anything. Exactly. Like, if yeah, nothing happens just... and you blame it on the other guy, um, I guess it's a, a you know you never have to be held accountable. Overseas now, Iran has restarted uranium enrichment at one of its underground facilities to 20 percent in the country's biggest breach to date of the 2015 nuclear agreement. That agreement, by the way, is still in place barely after the U.S. exited in 2018. At 20 percent enrichment, Iran would be one technical step away from making weapons grade nuclear material. The Iranian Revolutionary Guard also seized a South Korean oil tanker in the Persian Gulf. It's a provocative act that came around the one year anniversary of the U.S. killing of General Soleimani. The Iranians say they seized the ship because it was polluting. But it's really a way for them to show that they've got control over the Strait of Hormuz, a critical shipping route. Uh, because the, I mean, really, like the dog ate my homework. <laughs> totally. Uh, you remember that? The, the solo, remember, remember the beginning of last year when we thought that we were going to war with Iran and that was going to be <laughs> that was going to be the big news event of the year? God, we were so it was so quaint. Uh, <laughs> President Trump also still ordering. We were so uh, innocent back then, yeah, Carlo. Really? I know. Uh, President Trump ordering an American aircraft carrier uh, that was leaving the region to return as tensions keep simmering there ahead of this new administration in the U.S. taking office. One of the big foreign uh, policy questions that President-elect Biden is going to have to confront on day one is what to do about Iran. Uh, it is not going away. He said that he's wanted he has said that he's wanted to go back to the table and resurrect the 2015 nuclear deal, get the U.S. back in it. Uh, so we'll see. It's not that's easier said than done. Iran has said that they'll come back if we lift these crippling sanctions that the Trump administration has been putting on that country. Uh, but it's not going to be an easy process, especially given uh, this latest escalation. So as if this administration doesn't have enough on their hands, this is another this is one thing that they're going to have to deal with pretty quick. All right. One of the most famous business people in the world is missing. Rumors are just swirling over the apparent disappearance of Alibaba co-founder Jack Ma. He has not been seen in public or heard from in weeks. So if you're not familiar, he is a Chinese entrepreneur. He is among the richest people in the world. A couple of months ago, he gave a speech in which he was critical of the Chinese government. About a week after that, Beijing put the brakes on the IPO of one of his affiliate companies, Ant Group. I mean, this was supposed to be the biggest IPO yep. ever in history. Um, it was going to be this, this kind of joint 
IPO, I think, in Hong Kong and uh, do you remember where else? It was not Shanghai? New York. Or London? I forget now. I'll check. Um, but needless to say, the Chinese government put the brakes on it, and, and Jack Ma has not been heard from since, at least publicly. He didn't appear either in this uh, final episode of his own talent show. It's called Africa's Business Heroes, and it, it gives African entrepreneurs this chance to compete for, for money. Um, Carlo, I, you know this story has broken through, and my mom said to me yesterday, what do you think happened to Jack Ma? And I'm really? like, do you even know who Jack Ma test. is? <laughs> the mom test. The mom test is a, is, a, is a really important test in the news business. If mom starts talking about a story that you don't think is important, it's important just by virtue <laughs> of her talking about it. That's a, that's so a little seriously. life hack for our business, in all, in all seriousness. Uh, it, okay, so I mean, I'm going to say the elephant in the room here. Is it possible that he was actually kidnapped by the Chinese Communist Party? I can't imagine they would do that. But crazier things have happened, right? I mean, maybe he's just lying low, right? If I had $50 billion, which is what his net worth is, I, you, know, you wouldn't be seeing – you would never see or hear from me in public ever again. I'll put it that way. <laughs> oh, you wouldn't do this podcast with me every morning? I'd be long gone, Jill. I'd, I'd send you a postcard. <laughs> Um, you know, this is so if you're not familiar with Jack Ma, it would be like the equivalent of a, a Jeff Bezos going missing or or Mark Zuckerberg, you know, these huge names, um, even more so. Right. Like he like Alibaba is basically Apple, Amazon um, and all of them everything. combined. Yeah. Um, and that's if you don't, why, but Jill, that's. That, sorry to interrupt. I was just going to say that's that's why I um I, I just it's hard for me to believe that he that, that that something nefarious happened here because like if you're Beijing if you're the Chinese government it's in your best interest that people like Jack Ma exist right I mean they are they are they are icons of your economic ability if that makes sense but, right it, but okay so where is he like why wouldn't yeah. he just there's all the like if you knew that this was going on I I don't know unless. I, like, why wouldn't you just say, hey, I'm OK, you know, I'm just, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, I hope well, he's well, all right. I'm know. sure that he is. It's just it's a kind of a bizarre. It, and he's by the way. What? No, I was just going to say he's he's, a, he's also a, a an amazing philanthropist and just a really uh, just an impressive person um, and a hero, I think, to a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of people both in China and here. So, he started yeah. his career as a um, as a school teacher, actually. Yeah. Like yep. he's a he's a, a it's kind of like the, the quintessential American dream type of story. Yeah. Um, also, on the tech front, a group of hundreds of Google employees have now formed a labor union. It's a rare case of labor organization in Silicon Valley. The Alphabet Workers Union is members only. It's open to all employees and contractors at, at Google's parent Alphabet. Unlike conventional unions that focus on collective bargaining, the AW use stated goals to tackle issues like pay disparity, diversity, and ethics at the search giant. So it's I'm glad we were kind of making this distinction because they're not they're, the goals of this union are different than a typical union when yeah. as you'd think about it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know. This is a big deal if you follow labor labor organization for the reasons that you just mentioned, right? These kinds of companies like Google, they're just not hospitable for unions historically. And big tech is generally speaking just very anti-union, probably because the pay is so good and they don't feel the need to, you know, for collective bargaining agreements, right? Because they're they're generally speaking, these people are making pretty good money. Um, and have great but, benefits. Yeah. Like they yeah, have exactly. working conditions that most people yeah. would dream of. Exactly. So that's why they're, the, the, these union organizers are making a very big point of saying this is about tackling sort of like these systemic uh, issues like pay disparity, pay parity, uh, like you said, diversity. And issue, I mean, to keep in mind, it's all you know, it also has a lot to do with the other issue you mentioned, which is ethics. Right. You know, Google does business with um, with companies and governments all over the world. And this will give employees a better chance to say, hey, maybe we don't want to do an AI contract, you know, with the Saudis or something like that. I'm just pulling something, you know, out of my head. Um, but yeah, a, 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 an important uh, situation nonetheless. And now I think the, the question is, will you see workers at Facebook or Amazon? Yeah. You know, there's not Follow that many soon. of these right. these big groups. OK, really quickly, more details being made public about the plans for the NCAA men's basketball tournament. 
Remember that? It was canceled last year. It was at the height, at basically the start of the COVID pandemic in the mm -hmm. U.S. So all 68 teams that make the tournament are going to be playing in and around Indianapolis. It's the biggest attempt at a bubble in any major sport since the pandemic started. Teams are going to stay on uh, dedicated hotel floors. They're going to be tested regularly. A small number of family members will be allowed to attend games, but no details yet on whether any fans will be allowed in. So, so you yeah. thought, by the way, like you when I remember when March Madness was was canceled last year, that's yeah. when it that was one of the things that hit me when I'm like, OK, the world is changing yeah. here. You know, we'll talk about talk about news events that 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 uh, you know break through i remember having in in a group chat with my buddies from high school when you and i were freaking about covid in the in the real early days and they were just like this is nothing why is everybody freaking out why are you guys in the media making such a big deal about this and then and then they canceled march madness and i was and they were like okay maybe this is a big deal so that's just an interesting little uh, little line there um, but yeah selection sunday set for march 14th uh, at what point is a bubble not a bubble, I guess, is my question here, right? Because this is taking place. It's not like the the NBA where they're literally in a enclosed space in Disney World. This is over the in the you know, this is in Indianapolis and surrounding areas. A few arenas are going to be in play here. So we'll see. Uh, hopefully, hopefully at this point, you know, the testing alone will make this easier than it was um, in the summer for the NBA. Uh, look, they've got a big vested interest in the way of, of a lot oh, yeah. of money riding on the line to make this work. Um, and finally, the final episodes that Alex Trebek taped as host of Jeopardy are airing this week. The last episodes of Trebek's 36 year run were taped just just days, about 10 days, I think, before he succumbed to pancreatic cancer in November. After Friday's show, Jeopardy is going to begin a new era. Ken Jennings will be the interim host in a heartfelt pre-recorded message at the top of last night's show. Trebek asks the audience to open up your hearts to people suffering because of the pandemic. Isn't that incredible that he was doing this basically on his deathbed? I mean, I, I, God, I, it's, 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 it, I don't even have any words for that. Um, Ken Jennings, by the way, he's been tweeting out apologies for past things he's said on Twitter that may be offensive. What that's has a pretty he good said? Idea. That's so offensive. I, I don't even know. But he, he, he's been tweeting like, if you were looking at past tweets of mine, I may have said things that some might find offensive. That's a sign. If you ever hear somebody say that, that's a sign that they're uh, – they're in the market for a job, and he thinks he's gonna, you know, he's trying to get it. So hopefully Baker he won't be canceled. Machado, like who is our that, uh, Baker, may or may fills, not have said. he fills in for me sometimes, and he's Cheddar's. I mean, he's like the expert on everything, but he's he's a huge Jeopardy fan, and he's a big mm -hmm. media watcher. He thinks Jennings is a shoe in. Uh, who else would do it? I mean, it's, he's like the obvious guy, right? Wasn't George Stephanopoulos gunning for it? I, yeah, I remember that story, that, that story came out, and I was like, what? What are you doing, dude? You've got um, a good job as it is. Okay, so anyway, Friday's that last episode again, and, uh, you know, uh, what a great guy, Alex Trebek, right? I mean, and the work ethic to work 10, he was working up till 10 days before his death. Absolutely incredible. Um, okay, that's what you need to know for Tuesday, January 5th. All right, guys, see you tomorrow.